In this video, I'll be going through and showing you how I would approach the March 2024 Paper 2 Map Skills question for the IGCSE Geography Cambridge. And so the purpose of this video really is to show you how you can um, to go through the key skills required to answer these particular questions. Because for all those who are doing IGCSE Geography, um, you will have a Map Skills question coming up for Paper 2. So why a map skills question? Well, as you know, up until uh, they change the syllabus, so when the new syllabus starts, so in the next couple of years, this paper will end. Out of paper two, map skills is worth 20 marks out of a possible 60. You have to answer these questions. I would suggest you take about 30 minutes. And usually these questions sort of dip into a little bit of assessment, rivers, coasts, and maybe occasionally tourism. In preparation for this exam, you need the following equipments. A protractor. Preferably a 360 one, but if you have 180, that's fine. A ruler, sharp pencil and a sharpener, and a rubber. Other equipment, possibly a calculator, some string, but these are the key ones. And so before starting the exam, I would take that minute, one minute, just to draw on the 16 point compass with all its particular bearings. The reason is, Often two marks from this exam paper require you to identify the direction and bearing. And if you know what the angles are, and if you know what the various um, letters are for the various bearings, so the direction, sorry, this is a lot easier. Secondly, it's a really good idea if you just have a, take a quick moment just to highlight, circle, look at the scale of the map. In this particular case, the, the scale is 125,000 which means one centimetre on the map is 25,000 centimetres in real life, or one centimetre on the map is 250 metres in real life. And then look at the contour lines and if it tells you any contour line intervals. So let's get started. So what I would strongly suggest you do is, as you're watching this video, you have the question paper open in front of you with the map skills. Now, whenever I get these questions, this is the first piece of advice I give my students. Any extracts that appear on the map and on the question paper, sorry, have exactly the same dimensions as they do on the A3 map. So if you were to measure those grid squares on the exam paper, four by four centimeters, in this particular case, because of the scale, it would still be the same as it would be on the A3 map. The second thing I would do to help you focus is draw the outline of that extract onto the map, like I've done here. And once you've then done that, then you can start identifying the features because you know which area you need to focus on. And let's go through. So we need to circle A, so I need to find A on my map. There we go. I look at the key and this is sequential. So most keys are sequential. So you can see on the left hand side, you've got three symbols. And as you go to what their meanings are, what appears first on the left is the first in the sort of what it is. So the first one on the left is a resting area. Then you have a golf course. The second one, so I'm going to look really carefully. Okay, so we've got a black line with two arrows at the end of each sort of section of the black line. So I try and identify that, and that's a power line. The third one is land use. So I'm looking at colours. When it's land use, I'm looking at how the map has been coloured. So here, if I zoom in pretty close, I can see a variety of different uh, types of forests. Okay, but mainly, it's deciduous, so I'm going to write deciduous forest. Feature D, okay, something quite strange. Look here, okay, oh, okay. So there's an entrance to an underground evacuation. And then we've got the type of road at E. Okay, so I'm looking at the type of roads, so I need to look at the, the key for roads, and there we go. Okay, so we've got a regional road. Again, I'm going to put them in order. You could put the name of the regional road as well. Okay, so let's go through the answers. There we go. And you can see here, they're being really, really, really careful about what you put. Um, so for example, if you, uh, for the regional roads, you have to get the type of road correct. You have to put the type of road in, and so the actual, like, um, it's not main road, it's the actual, yeah, the individual type of road matching particularly the colors. And as I said, you can put the name of the road as well. So moving on, a very common map skills question they ask you is six figure grid reference. And this one in particular is quite nice because you have a list of options to use. Just sorry, a list of options to select. So how to get started? Please remember that the um, dimensions, like I said before, the dimensions on the exam paper for any insert or extract like you can see here on the left hand side is exactly the same what appears on the map. 
So first thing I need to do is find the feature in circle, which helpfully has been done here. And I'm also going to find it on my A3 map, just so I can match the two together. And then I'm just going to double check the dimensions on my map are exactly the same here. So you can see, yep, I've got a four centimeter grid square, and that's really important. So before I get started, I'm going to work out the four figure grid reference. To do that, I put a, um, a dot in the left hand corner of the grid square that this particular feature is in. Although that dot looks like it's sort of between two features, because the F is in the top box, I'm going to use the box of the bottom left hand corner. I go along the corridor to the number that's in line, so that's 99, and go upstairs to the number that's in line of that bottom left hand corner, which is 69. So my four figure reference is 9963, but I need to work out the third and sixth number. In your head, what you need to do is divide up the grid square into a 10 by 10 grid. But if you were to draw that onto your um, 10 by 10 grid, if you were to draw that onto the six figure, that would take an awful long time. Another way of doing it is, divide, is to um, divide the width and the height of that grid square into by 10. So we know it's 4 centimetres by 4 centimetres grid square. If I was divided by 10, I know that each point on that map is 4 millimetres. So if I was going to measure across the centre of the circle, it would be up to 7 millimetres. If I was to divide that by 4, really my answer would be 99.1 or 2. Now this is when I would slightly disagree with the mark scheme. I would argue that that feature is closer to 2 than 1. But, uh, as I'll show you later, why we put one. And for this, the feature is mostly, we're going up the stairs, the feature is mostly on the line, so we're going to put zero. It's 99.1, 69, zero. When we go back to our options, um, it can't be 69.99 because that's the other way around. So it has to be the bottom two options. Of those, unhelpfully, it gives us something 99.1 or 99.3. It's definitely not three, because that would be much further along the lines. So that's why I would tick the box 99.1.69.0. It's really confusing. If you, if you didn't have a list of options and you put 99.1 or 99.2, I'm pretty sure they would give you the correct answer. But in this case, they've given us a list of options. And so you need to look at the one that it most applies to. It was closer to one than it was three. Okay, a nice question one here. Using evidence from the map, identify two ways that Taurus could descend from its peak. Okay, so the key word here is descend. That means get down from something. So if you're at the top of that peak and you were a tourist, you probably walked there or you maybe took a cable car up or you pretty much arrived there by some means. How are you going to descend? How are you going to come back down from there? Well, there are other ways you could do it. So, for example, you could take the footpath, it's probably the easiest way. You could also take the other road, as you can see that footpath follows predominantly another road. Or you could paraglide if you really wanted to. Here, you can see um, how you would descend from here. Again, I really don't understand why cable, um, if you can descend in a car, why can't you descend in a cable car, for example? Um, very annoying, but go for the obvious ones, which are footpath and road. Now, these three next three questions tend to be grouped together. Compass direction, distance and bearings. So let's go through them each one. So when you're looking at the compass directions from the peak of the dome to the peak of the one at the top corner, OK, where you're starting from. So in this case, the Puy de Dome, that is the start point and you're going to the end point. Points. So when you do that, this is when dry, um, having your compass bearing that you drew at the start of the question paper is really useful. So after you've marked on the start and the end, I want you to draw a north arrow from the feature at the start. I then want you to connect those two points with a line, take out your protractor and work out the bearing. So in this case, it's a 360 degree one. If you had 360, it'd be really easy, but because you, if you don't, I'll show you how to do it. Move it to the other side. You know that bearings go up to 360. And so this one 
is between the naught and the 10, which is 5 degrees. And so what I'm going to do is do 360 degrees minus 5, which, if I plot on my compass, would give me a bearing, sorry, a direction of north northwest. Or you could probably put north as well. Okay? Distance in meters, luckily, you're just going between the two peaks, so it's a straight line distance. So again, we mark on the start and we mark on the end. And then I'm going to join a straight line between those two points. I'm going to check my scale, which means that one centimetre on the map is 25,000 centimetres in real life, or one centimetre on the map is 250 metres in real life. And so I'm then going to measure that distance, which is 11.3 centimetres. And then I'm then going to convert that, so I'm going to times that by 250, which gives me an answer of 2,825 metres. So I'm going to write that in there. So now we need to work out the bearings between those two points. Luckily, we've already marked on, we've drawn on that straight line. So we just need to remember which is the start and which is the end. And so from the start point, which is at the bottom of the map, we draw on the little north arrow. We then take up our protractor to work out the bearing, which comes to about 12 degrees. And remember, if you then had to ask about the direction, you would put that onto your map and you would put the direction about north, north, east. So here we go. And you notice for the first question, you could put north, but it's definitely not northwest because northwest would be 315 degrees bearing. Let's say it's closer to north, northwest than north. And notice for the bearing for the final question, they always give you a degree of tolerance and for the straight line distance. OK, so how to describe the relief of that particular dome? So here's the dome. What do you mean by relief? Remember, it's the height and shape of the land. When we talk about the height, we always look at contour lines. We've got spot heights and triangulation pillars, and usually they just tell us what the highest points are and what the lowest points are. If you can, you can always name the peaks. When it comes to the shape, it's pretty much we're looking at you know, the contour lines and what shape do those mean? Are the contour lines close together? If that's the case, then the land is steep. If they're far apart, it's gentle. And then we can use it to work out the shape of the hill and if whether or not it's hilly or mountainous. So if we go back to this, the heights, well, the highest point is 1,465 metres. The shape, well, it's very steep sided. As you can see, the contour lines are very close together and it's a round hill or a conical hill. So my answer, and you can see the, what the various points I can mention, is that the dome is 1,465 metres high, tick, mark and it is a round con and steep side and it is round mark conical shapes and steep sided moving on to these which i really like these ones are the spot the difference or similarities round so we've got the two grid squares that we need to look at and we need to decide if those fountains or we you know, decide where those particular feature on the left hand side appear remember those particular features those two grid squares are exactly the same as what they appear in the A3 map. So what I would do is draw a box on that map, onto your A3 map, showing what you are focusing on. So it helps you to identify that area and it gives you a sense of focus. Very much like the first question, we're looking at the land use maps. So here I'm looking for a Christian or religious building. If I go to my key, I'm looking for those two symbols and I can't see any. So I'm going to put neither grid square land over 800 meters well the contour lines on the left hand box definitely <clears throat> are over 800 meters whereas in the right hand box they look mostly below 800 meters so i'm going to tick for this box here a fountain so i'm looking for a, a blue square definitely on the right hand side none on the left and then a temporary water course so i'm looking for a blue dashed line and again they appear in both boxes so I'm going to write this. OK, so the final question here. Describe the site of the settlements shown in the southeast of the map. So basically, when you have to describe the site, you need to tell me why did the first settlers choose that area? So I'm just going to go through a little bit of the theory. If you know this, skip through to the question bit. But it's just a little bit of useful um, revision. So why was a land chosen to be built upon? Usually settlements are chosen because in the old days, because it's close to a water source, which you can then use to uh, grow crops, drink, or use for transports, 
fertile soil, obvious reasons. Relief, you want it to be either not too high, not too low. You want it to be relatively flat because it's easier to build on and you might want to consider defensive features as well. And then maybe close to resources to either build your homes or for example, wood or stone, or to maybe sell. And more recently, you might want to actually have, make it really accessible to other places, so close to roads, rivers, etc. And also another useful one to have is the type of settlement as well. So dispersed settlements tend to be where there are lots of farms spread out. And this is very popular in rural areas. You've either got linear settlements, which tend to follow and snake along roads and rivers, or the final one, which is nucleated, where pretty much you know, a, the town has built around a central point, like a road or a crossroads at particular places. And so it's generally round in shape. And these tend to be sort of in flatter areas, tend to be where something's crossing a river or something like that, and or where roads meet. So if we go back to the town of Riot, so you can see that it's, it's definitely next to a river, and that, that river flows through. It's at the bottom of a very steep sided valleys and it's close to lots of main roads. Now, because it's at the bottom of the valley, it's not really rounded like a nucleated settlement. So because I would say it's more linear, definitely being built along a narrow valley floor. And then the settlement follows the river, which I've named and the road, the D64. So putting all those points together and looking at the mark scheme, you can see we've got lots of marks written in a very narrow, in, in almost two cent, very short sentences. So to conclude, thank you for watching. Remember, any boxes or features or anything like that you have in the exam paper, draw them on the A3 map. Draw on compass with bearings. Identify the scale and contour lines. Take it slowly. The skills I've outlined in this video are you know, will always appear, but you just need to get used to applying them to different exam questions. So. This exam, you practice through past papers. Thank you. If you think it's useful, please recommend.